I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of the field as well as kind of how our program, I'm just making it so that I can kind of see all of you while I'm doing this. There we go. Um, I want to be able to kind of give you a little bit of information, you know, about the program, like I said, and a little bit about the field. Um, and then that will help you to decide kind of what you want to do. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions, you know, because I really want to see, you know, what kind of even drew you to this session, because sometimes I think um, a lot of folks are, are hip and hip to the idea of wanting to go into just maybe mental health counseling, but rehab counseling is, is definitely an expansion of that. And, and I'll explain how. So like I said, I've been, I've been in this field. If you count when I started, I'm not going to give you the date I started because then I really feel old. But um, when I, when I started in this um, field, you know, I've, gosh, so that, that's almost going on, for, it's like 25 years ago. So it's, it's really grown and changed. And I think that's the best part about it. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about it. So rehab counseling is a specialty of counseling. Okay. We are what's called a KCREP accredited program. So KCREP is the accreditation body. Um, right now, it's kind of the authority in accreditation for the, for the most part. And we have within our department, we have three KCREP accredited programs, but we actually have two um, KCREP accredited programs on in rehabilitation. So per, um, I keep saying core because that was our old accrediting body. Per KCREP, we have what's called rehabilitation counseling, but we also have rehabilitation, um, clinical rehabilitation counseling. And I'll tell you just a little bit of the difference about that when I tell you the difference in our two programs, okay? But rehab counseling is awesome because it really is working with all people with disabilities. So, and we're looking very broadly and very holistically. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our values in rehab counseling and how that's, that's kind of important to us. But the idea is to work with all people with disabilities. And you'll see that in your practice, you can actually specialize. We're gonna teach you how to work with all people, but in your practice, you might decide, hey, once I graduate, I really wanna work with this population or I really wanna work in this setting or this age group. And, and that's yours to choose because we're gonna train you how to do all those things, okay? So we're working to promote inclusion and integration of all people with disabilities, okay? The idea is really to focus on better quality of life and really taking the process kind of in an empowerment route because the idea is that we don't wanna do for people. We wanna, I always tell my students, we want to make ourselves useless. We want to teach people that they don't need us. We want to teach people that they can be able to learn the skills to do things on their own. I promise you, you're never going to run out of people who need you, but you want to get the people who are working with you to be able to assume more independence or interdependence, you know, which is much more culturally appropriate. Um, and the idea of doing as much as they can, or at least exerting as much choice. Because if you know anything about disability, you're gonna know that there are some folks that have significant impairments or you know, um, complications because of their disability, but they can still choose. Even someone who has a spinal cord injury that may need full physical help to do, their, do aspects of their daily living and anything about them, it's important that they choose who's doing that with them. You know? So really increasing that autonomy, that choice through this empowerment model. So we're looking to not not necessarily, I'm not going to say there isn't a responsibility of the person. So yes, there's probably some piece that that person has to change and learn skills and, and, and integrate, but we're also really looking at how society and the environments receive the person with a disability. And so when we talk about things like accommodations, when we talk about inclusion, it's really how do we change the environment? How do we enact policies? How do we change attitudes? You know, my, my son, I, over the course of the pandemic, I've been buying a lot of like t-shirts to support causes and things like that. I've been trying to support a lot of disabled activists in, in purchasing some of their, their art and things like that. So my son has all these t-shirts. He has all these disability rights and disability justice t-shirts and he's only eight. And his teacher is like, these are the coolest things. I'm like, I try to tell him what they're for and, and everything, but you know, he had his, the future is accessible shirt on yesterday. Um, he had the other day, if you can be anything, be inclusive. You know, so really trying to, you know, promote that. And, and I think it really will rely on the younger generations um, to really espouse these things. Because, you know, as I'm looking around, most of the people who are on the screen, you grew up in a generation where special education and general education were together in the same building. And, and you grew up, you know, probably having friends that had disabilities or with family members who had disabilities. And it wasn't, or, you know, perhaps you have disability identity. And it, and it wasn't this, 
shameful, hide it away, separate it. It was a very, it was much more integrated, but obviously as a society, we could even do more to do that. And I feel like that's such a great um, responsibility, but really an honor to that that's what our professional calling is. And that's how we engage. Okay. So like I said, we are trained, rehab counselors are trained as general counselors and with the same you know, whether it's our mental health counseling program or our rehab counseling program or, you know, uh, other programs that are accredited like school counseling, marriage and family addictions, there's kind of this core set of knowledge that any counselor needs, okay? And then on top of that, we layer our specialty. So looking at disability, looking at the environment, looking at those types of things, policies, legislation that can help, okay? So who do we serve, okay? When I keep talking about people with disabilities, well, it is all people with disabilities. We will train you to do that, okay? I think sometimes the word rehab counseling is misleading because you know I always get the, oh, you're a physical therapist. Well, no, nope, that didn't work out. But, or I get the, you know, oh, that must be substance use. And it's like, well, yeah, for some people, you know, because even though rehabilitation, we think of rehabilitation, either as a physical rehabilitation or like a recovery model for substance use, um, which is part of it, same, you know, when they, when we talk about mental health counseling, guess what? We've been, we've been working with people with psychiatric disabilities since the 1930s, okay, in the field of rehab counseling. So this isn't new. Um, we just don't learn specifically one disability. We learn them all. And then you're trained as a generalist to go work with any of those populations. And also disabilities that you might not see. Sometimes people don't consider some of the diseases that a person has, like, like Crohn's disease, if you see on here, fibromyalgia, or maybe um, recovering from a heart attack. You know, the person may have some complications and we can help as a rehab counselor, like, okay, you had a heart attack, you got some limitations, but you wanna go back to your job. You wanna go back to your activity level. How do we do that safely? And, and, and really kind of, you know, make sure that the person has the services and the resources that they need. When it comes to our values, First and foremost, and this goes back, if you, if you do come to the program, you're gonna hear me and other, other faculty talk about Beatrice Wright. And she really was, she was a rehab psychologist and she just kept adding to this list of values that really focused and centered who we are as rehab counselors. So first and foremost, there's been a major shift since the seventies away from I'm the counselor, I'm the expert to you're the client, you're the expert in your life and how can I help you? So very individualized, we don't pride ourselves on cookie cutter. We really wanna learn about the person. Even if you have five clients that are kind of the same age, the same gender and have the same disability, they experience that totally differently. So we use these to like give us a sense of who the person is and what they might be feeling, but we really learn about them individually. Also, like I said, that holism, we're not just gonna fix your body. We're gonna look at your mind, your spirit, your spirituality, you know, where you live who you interact with, okay? And really take into account, you know, all the settings you're in and all the identities that you have from a very intersectional model and really try to incorporate that into the planning that we do. But we really uphold dignity and rights, okay? That human dignity, that there, there should be equity, there should be equality um, for all people with disabilities. And that's not always the case. There's definitely greater acceptance say of folks with physical disabilities, maybe sensory disabilities like you know, blindness or deafness, less acceptance when you get into maybe more cognitive, intellectual or um, psychiatric or substance use, but we really, need to, we really need to move the needle on that. And because of that, we're very strengths-based. When you think of disability just from the word, dis means like you'd have less of. But the idea is that instead of focusing on, well, here's the things you can't do, well, all right, what would be the point of focusing on that? Why don't we try to optimize the things that you can do, the strengths that you have and build off and plan off of that? Like I said, empowerment and advocacy, our codes of ethics really empower us and require us to take on advocacy both with our client, if they have the ability to do that, on behalf of our client, if they don't, but then also on behalf of our profession, you know, really to exert and say, hey, if there's a group or if, or if there's something impacting people with disabilities, we, we wanna be the professionals that do that because we are uniquely trained for that. And there are a lot of, um, you'll see, I think it's on my next slide. There are a lot of knowledge areas that you're gonna have to learn. So really competence is important. And that responsibility is placed on me 
because as a rehab educator, I'm what's considered a gatekeeper. I have to make sure anyone I bring into the program, as well as anyone I graduate from the program, is going to be upholding these values, is going to have the knowledge and skills that are going to make them effective. Okay, because really that that dignity and that welfare of the client is is the utmost importance for what we're doing. And then lastly, collaboration and innovation. Okay, I always tell my students, you will know the least you will ever know about rehab counseling the day you graduate. Okay, because the idea is like we just give you that information, but then you have to apply it out in the real world. Okay, and you have to continually learn. And that's the cool part, because with your um, certification, you know, your national certification, as well as if you take a licensure route, it requires you to do continuing education, you know, in order to keep up those skills. Because think about it, if you rely on skill, you know, if you, if you graduate in 2024 and you're practicing until the 2060s, stuff's going to change, okay? So if you're not keeping abreast of that, you are not going to maintain that competence. You're not going to be as effective as a counselor. And I think rehab counselors probably above anyone else, like we really pride ourselves on interdisciplinary work that we're saying, hey, guess what? You're the expert in that, come here. We, I want you on my team because you're gonna make the life for my person and my client better because you have this knowledge that maybe, you know, I could probably muddle through, you know, we learn about family dynamics. We learn about family counseling, but guess what? A marriage and family therapist is an expert in that. So why would I try to muddle through it when I can, I can partner with someone who has more expertise and then I can share my expertise with them and we can have much more collaboration. So that I love the most about rehab counseling and rehab education. So I wasn't lying when I said, there's a lot of knowledge that we're gonna pour into you. Um, obviously this is gonna be from more of what we call a didactic approach where we're just kind of imparting knowledge, but also from this idea that you're going to, you know, really have to demonstrate skill in these areas. You're going to have to understand both the knowledge, but the, also the application of it. Okay. And like I said, we look at it from an individual perspective, but then we look at it from much more of a collective societal perspective. So yes, a lot of counseling related and, and this is on top of, like I said, there are the eight core areas for K-PREP that all counselors need. This is actually the knowledge you need to pass your certification exam as a rehabilitation counselor, okay? So the idea of, yes, how do I work with, how do I work with diverse people? How do I utilize techniques and theories of counseling, both for individuals and group settings, those who experience trauma? How do I understand both the medical aspect of disability, which is important. However, we, we, are, we really espouse the biopsychosocial model where we really understand, yes, there's the medical part, but then there's the psychological part, but then there's the integration with society and the environment. So again, much more of a holistic model, or we use a socio-political model, which again, we look to, to impact and change and shift society and attitudes in order to make um, environments more inclusive for people with disabilities. So while this might sound daunting and seems daunting, you know, for a 60 credit program, guess what? We're, we're gonna be there every step of the way for you. And, and I think you're gonna to start to live and breathe it. We have a lot of folks that are in the program and will work um, part-time or full-time. You know, And if you're not coming into the field or into the program with a job, usually within the first like semester, I'll have students come up to me and be like, oh my gosh, like all my classmates are talking about these things that they're doing in their job or things they're doing in their internship. And like, you kind of feel like you're not connecting that in the same way. So. We work um, to help a lot of the students who aren't employed in the field get employed in the field early on in their program so that they can really start, even before they get into like field work, really start integrating and applying to make you know, that, that knowledge come to life. Keep it, take it away from the theoretical and more toward the practical. What's also important, I said the values, but dispositions, again, which is kind of like a uh, it's very aspirational. A disposition is not something you can see or feel, okay? A disposition is just, you know, this way of thinking, this demeanor that you have, this uh, mindset that you have. And we need to make sure, this is kind of where I really focus on when I'm bringing someone into the program. Yes, we're going to look at your GPA. We're going to look at those sorts of things. And that's important because it is a rigorous program. But, you know, some people will ask, well, you know, what's the GPA required? You know, we look for a 3.0. There have been some people who have had lower than that, but we also take a look at, okay, where, where were the stumbling blocks? You know, I've had a lot of folks be like, well, I thought I was going to be pre-med 
in the beginning. And so I took all these sciences and I didn't do so hot in them. And I'm like, well, okay, I can, I can relate to that actually. And so the idea being, yes, that's, that's a part of you. Again, a holistic approach. That's a part of you, the academic part of you. But the professional dispositions is really that core that we want to focus on. You know, we're going to be looking at, you know, you're going to write a, um, a personal statement about yourself. You're going to submit letters of recommendation. We're going to be looking in there. You're going to do a personal interview with me with, with scenario-based questions that kind of bring out and, you know, and, and exemplify these qualities. And this is the part we can't teach, really. You know, the part that a person has to understand how to work with others, how to kind of keep on track of themselves, be self-motivated, you know, enact some time management, think about things critically, you know, because that is probably the greatest shift of going from undergrad to graduate. You know, it's not just going to be here, I gave you knowledge, and now I'm giving you a quiz and give it directly back to me. It's going to be, I gave you knowledge, and now, now I'm giving you a case study, and you have to prove to me that you learned all these things. You have to really problem solve it, rather than just, I gave you the right answer back, okay? Because I always tell my students, it's like, there's definitely more than one right answer, as long as you can justify to me that, that you believe that's the right answer and you've applied the information correctly. So, you know, when you're, if you're engaging in an application with the program, um, think about these things, keep these things in mind. And that's what, that's what we're looking for. We want you to show us that, you know, you're at, you know, again, you're not gonna be fully cooked. You're still, you know, you're still going into grad school and we're gonna help you with that. But, you know, we want to see that those individuals coming in are going to have a leg up. They're going to, they're going to be able to hit the ground running um, and really, you know, take part in ownership in what they're doing in the graduate program. So, like I said, there's a lot of career paths and a lot of ways you can kind of tailor what you're doing. So practice settings kind of abound. Um, originally, our field was about going into what was called the state federal system. So, if you're familiar with New York, you might've heard of Access VR, which is the state agency. If you're from somewhere else, like I've now lived in four states, it was, and that's the hardest thing because from state to state, it's called something different. You know, in Massachusetts, it was Mass Rehab Association. In Maryland, it was DOORS, Division of Rehab Services. Michigan was again, MRS. And now we're in New York and it's Access VR, okay? Which again, long acronyms, but, um, but the idea is that the, these are agencies. So the Veterans Administration is also part of that. Um, there's also separate agencies that work specifically with people who are blind because there's a, a higher level of need and, and definitely some specificity. Um, there's also um, a lot of services for individuals who are deaf because again, you're talking about a language and communication need that the person has. You can do, um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of um, community-based agencies. And I'm sure if you're kind of in Long Island or in your own, Kind of in your own area, you can think about things like goodwill, and you can think about um, United Cerebral Palsy. You know, around here, um, and I'll, I think I have a list of some of these, but like Free or Mental Health Association. So these community-based agencies that work with smaller caseloads of people, but very, very much one-on-one -on -one with a lot of interaction. There's private insurance work. There are a lot of folks working in hospitals and medical settings, helping to transition people out if they've acquired a disability. Centers for Independent Living are working with people um, on really integrating and engaging in their communities. Help, they don't do housing programs, but like they give you a lot of information, okay? And then you can even be working with employers, you know, like in like large corporations. If you think about large corporations, the idea is like first, they wanna make sure they're preventative and not causing disability with the work that they're doing. But even within your, you know, I think about Hofstra, we have what's called an EAP program, an employee assistance program. So say during the pandemic, I start experiencing anxiety or depression. There's a program within my university where I can go and get assistance with that. So a lot of times rehab counselors will, will work with EAPs, maybe a person acquired a disability like carpal tunnel. Okay, how do I accommodate their job? You know, how do I change that? How do I help them adjust to that disability and, and you know, see it again from a strengths-based approach rather than this you know, perpetually tragic viewpoint that, that some people um, may have, because sometimes we're socialized to think about it that way. Um, like I said, you can specialize by population. You know, I, my partner, Jamie Midas, who's on faculty with me, she originally had specialized working with individuals with traumatic brain injury, okay? Um, I've done work with developmental disability, but like I said, if you say are fluent in ASL, then you're probably going to gravitate toward deaf or deafblind populations. Um, obviously, we have a burgeoning autism spectrum and neurodiversity population. 
Um, but really psychiatric substance use. And as we're, you know, we're kind of thinking about, you know, all these different kinds of medical changes that we're seeing currently, we have to be ready for newer populations. Um, there's a lot of disabilities that have recently been caused by climate change or natural disasters and things like that. Um, so disability is kind of ever changing, whereas you might not, you might not think it, it would be. You can also specialize by function. I'm a certified vocational evaluator. That's another um, national certification. And so my kind of niche is assessment. So usually when you specialize in a function, you're gonna do that function with a broad range of people, okay? So I would do assessment with kind of whoever was referred to me. Whereas when that person moved from assessment to say a case manager, sometimes the case managers would have like a specific like transition age youth population or just people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so you can do working with just one function like job placement. It's a skill, you know, but it is, it is so rewarding to be able to find individuals jobs and be able to, to regain some of that independence. Like I said, you can specialize by age group. Um, transition age youth is really where a lot of the focus is right now because the idea of how do we more successfully transfer someone and even early, I, I teach transition courses because this is my other area of specialty and not just, you know, all right, you're graduating high school, what do you do now? Well, how do you kind of transition someone with a disability between middle school and high school and high school and college or high school in the world of work or even undergrad into grad school? You know, we're seeing a higher participation of people with disabilities in higher ed, both undergrad and grad, okay? Um, again, working age adults, even seniors. Okay, the idea of, yes, you know, the one thing I always say about disability is it's, it's probably the, you know, if you live long enough, you'll experience some level of it, you know, and, and the idea is, yes, there are a lot of disabilities that come from natural aging, but nowadays, you know, people are working into their 60s, sometimes into their 70s. So the idea of how do you kind of accommodate for that, you know, person who may be acquiring disabilities as they age in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So there is work even with seniors, but even if they retire, how do you then again, engage in meaningful life, you know, and not just spend your life sitting on a couch or, you know, sitting in your home. Some of the more innovative things that I've seen recently, and I am like forever amazed that my students will come back and will be like, oh my God, I'm doing this now. You know, I, I have students who are doing policy analysis. You know, I have students that are doing accommodations for the educational testing services, you know, the ones who do the SATs and everything like that, they're determining who gets those accommodations. You can testify at hearings as a vocational expert or if a person has a disability. Um, working with benefits, those who are on social security and Medicare and Medicaid. Life care planning has to do with those who experience kind of catastrophic disabilities and how do you make sure that their plan, you know, they're planning for their financial as well as kind of resources throughout the, their lifespan. Um, working on colleges, disability services counselors, working in high schools, and then even being a diversity and inclusion specialist because you know, obviously we, we often think about gender equity or LGBTQ equity or racial justice, but in terms of disability as you know, a diversity and inclusion factor and, and how to incorporate that into businesses and universities and, and all those sorts of things. And most recently, really the, the response to the COVID pandemic. Um, there's a lot of folks that are gonna be coming back. I don't know if you've heard about like long haul symptoms of COVID, you know, a lot of neurological or physical or respiratory or cardiac. And again, these are not people who are nearing their retirement age. These are people in their thirties and forties who are, need to go back to work. So rehab counselors can really assist that. How do we get out there to employers and say, okay, how do you just accommodate folks? How do you understand this? How do you, you know, how do you talk to these individuals and, and get them to understand the nature of their limitations and how to use accommodations um, to make that more effective and, and just adjust to their disability and their new health status. So I hope now I've gotten you to understand rehab a little bit. Like I said, it's a very fast growing um, specialty. You know, it really, in the time that I've been doing it, it, it just continues to grow. Still projected, projected to see at least a 10% growth. I'm actually going to say it's probably well, not that it's necessarily going to grow, but I'm also looking at a lot of people who are near retirement age. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities opening up. Um, and what I've found too with my students, they graduate with a master's. And I've had folks, gosh, within five years, next thing you know, they're an administrator. You know, they're really working into these positions of leadership. 
um, and really assuming these types of things where they are. It is one of the highest paid counseling specialties. Um, you know, even if you take into account, well, obviously you're going to get paid differently in New York than you are in Nevada or, you know, Iowa, but the idea of a lot of the systems that we can work in, the state and federal system, the veteran system, um, they tend to be higher paying jobs than, than some of the community um, agency practices that maybe some other counselors might be working in. We are a federally supported training program. Um, my partner, Jamie, as I mentioned, um, she, two years ago, and we've actually had these grants for about the past 30 years, but two years ago, she was awarded, um, she applied for and it was awarded a, ten, um, a $1 million grant. And of that $1 million, 65% uh, of it has to go directly to student tuition. So if you qualify for that grant, we've been um, partially provide, you know, providing, providing partial tuition um, for students. Usually if you're funded by the grant, you get about 25 to 30% of your tuition covered. And the way the grant works is that you give back in time, okay? So you spend, say, you know, two and a half years in the program or three years in the program. For every year you're funded, you give back two years in time. You just basically work. And, you know, when, when you're done working that six years, you say, they say, okay, thank you. You know, thank you for being a rehab counselor. If for some reason you change your mind and want to become an artist, you pay back like a loan. Okay, so, you know, there, there are some stipulations, and if you are interested in that funding stream, I can put you in touch with Dr. Midas, and she'll really give you the ins and outs on, on how to do that. Really dynamic and creative. You know, I think the best part is that you can really, I, I, I wanted to use a cool analogy for rehab counselors, because I think we're, we're definitely so, like, malleable and flexible, and then I was like, oh my god, we're like the chameleons of the counseling world. You know, we're, we're ever shifting over the decades and apparently chameleons have like a lifespan of like a year. So then I was like, that's a really bad analogy. But the idea of being able to just like meld and move into different spaces and really adapt and accommodate because that's who we are. You know, it's kind of the mantra, no matter, you know, who I talk to across the country, it's like, yeah, we're rehab, we're flexible. Like that, that's our point. Like we're, we're trained to be that way. So you can really take your skill set and find interesting ways to incorporate it. And we are also the only counseling specialty with the knowledge to serve all people with disabilities. Okay, we do, we do also have a very specific um, vocational focus because again, we really value the therapeutic value of work. The idea, you know, I think sometimes in the medical model, it's like get the person cured, get the person fixed, and then we'll think about the other parts of their life. Whereas even if you think about mental health or substance use, most of the time people are working when those things occur. And it's like, how do they then get back to some stability and recovery? Well, guess what? Jobs are, are really a strong identity, you know, and a strong source of support and resources for a person. So we, we do focus on that, but it is not the only service and not the only focus that we have as rehab counselors. And I swear to you, it's the most amazing career you probably never heard about, okay? And even in the state of New York, we are one of only three schools that have a rehab counseling program in all of the state of New York. So as I mentioned, we have two programs. Um, we recently were transitioned um, in the state of New York. We used to confer MSED degrees. Now we're MS degrees, so Master of Science degrees. Both programs are 60 credit because that is a KCREP requirement. There's a little bit of, <clears throat> little bit of difference in them. Um, both programs, you are eligible to become a national rehabilitation, a nationally certified rehabilitation counselor. Okay, that means you sit for your exam, which most students do prior to graduation. You pass the exam, you graduate, you submit your transcript, you're a CRC. You can up and move to any of the 50 states and certain territories. And the next day you are a rehab counselor. You don't have to do anything else, okay? It's a little bit different, different when we talk about licensure. So both programs are CRC eligible, okay? If you do the, what we probably, you'll hear people say the traditional rehab counseling. Um, this one is more of, you choose the focus of what you want it to be, okay? The Rehab Counseling and Mental Health prepares you for licensure in the state of New York, also as a mental health counselor. So there's more specificity on, on working with psychiatric populations or substance use populations as a specialty within rehab counseling. If you do the more traditional program, you kind of choose your specialty focus because you have a lot more kind of latitude of where you can do your field work experiences. You can do it in on a college campus. You know, you could do it in the veteran. You know, in veterans, you can do it in the state vocational rehab agency. 
um, community-based. We've had folks work in forensic settings and prisons and, and we're kind of wherever you want that to do, to be. We do also have a, um, a specific course focused on transition. And then you have an elective built in. And one thing that's interesting about the elective that we're exploring too, is that we're gonna be working with OASIS, which is the, um, it's the department in New York that oversees substance use counseling. And we're working to um, build into the curriculum that you would be kind of fast tracked to get your KSAC, which is a certified um, addictions counselor, okay? So that's kind of within the MS degree, uh, the MS and rehab counseling degree, sorry. In the MS in Rehab Counseling and Mental Health, again, the CRC, but now you're eligible for state licensure. And licensure is different than the certification. Everything for licensure happens after you graduate. We prepare you for the knowledge base and the coursework and the fieldwork experience. But once you graduate, then you apply for licensure. You have to sit for an additional exam. And then you have to complete uh, 3,000 hours of supervised clinical work after you graduate before you can become licensed. And while we say it's LMHC in the state of New York, if you say come from somewhere else and you get your education in New York, you can then say move to Pennsylvania and say, okay, well, I wanna apply for licensure there. And certain states, and I think Pennsylvania is actually one of them, um, it, they say, okay, well, they might be an LPC state, which is a licensed professional counselor. So the idea is that they take all general counselors, license them, and then you practice under your specialty. So certain states will actually take that CRC exam you've already done and count it as your licensure exam, okay? So it's different state to state, but we are approved in the state of New York um, for licensed mental health counseling. So while you may be interested in going to a specific sole clinical mental health counseling program, this also gives you the opportunity to get the skill set, knowledge base and the opportunity for certification as a rehab counselor as well. So definitely it's like, I say it's like mental health counseling with a very holistic lens, okay? And with this, your field work is a little bit more narrowed because you have to be in an approved mental health or substance use setting in order to qualify for the licensure, okay? So with the rehab counseling, you get a little bit more leeway where you wanna choose your interest and, and focus. The um, rehab counseling mental health is gonna be focused on a little bit more in that psychiatric populations to qualify for licensure. If anyone, um, oh, sorry, I, I thought I had the slides in the other order. So if you are an undergraduate student at Hofstra currently, um, we have um, accelerated programs through sociology, criminology, community health, and psychology that we're developing and will be up and running in the fall, which means you can apply in your junior year. And then in your senior year, you begin taking your master's level courses. It's two in the fall and up to three in the spring. So you can take up to 15 credits as an undergrad with your undergrad tuition. And it'll count both for your undergraduate degree and for your master's degree, okay? So it's a little bit of a, of a cost savings there. But what's good about the accelerated programs is that you're not locked into taking the 15 credits. You could take one class and that's fine. So it offers that flexibility and it'll allow you that. If you're in another program, um, it's a little bit different. You can just generally take, if you're at Hofstra, you can just generally take up to nine credits of, of graduate work while you're an undergrad. Um, and we could help design that for you. If you're an external applicant from Hofstra, then obviously you have to have an undergraduate degree with some of our core prerequisites. So, you know, upper level psychology classes, criminology, human services, sociology, anything in kind of community health, anything related to disability, social justice, things like that. 3.0 um, preferred. And then again, if you already have any master's credit, we can see about transferring that in. Um, if you did, graduate coursework at Hofstra, we could see about even, even um, allowing more in. But then I mentioned, um, if you are on this call and you already have a master's degree, um, those who have a master's degree in a related field can become eligible for the CRC exam, which CRCC who oversees our credential, they'll review your transcripts, say these are the classes you have to take and we will design a program of study for you. Um, and then that either includes an internship or you can use paid work experience. And if you already hold a rehab counseling um, master's degree, then you can come back and do the advanced certificate for the clinical mental health counseling or the mental health counseling licensure. You have to take another exam. You have to take courses and an internship. It can't be work experience. Um, and then you can be um, eligible for licensure. 
So like I said, we are interdisciplinary and so is our department. We have marriage and family. So if you're interested in these other fields as well, you, I can tell you about them or I can set you up with the program directors of those. We have school counseling, mental health counseling, license, uh, sorry, marriage and family therapy, as well as creative art therapy. Unfortunately, if you're interested in creative art therapy, you're, you have to have taken a lot of art classes first. So, you know, you'd have to kind of been thought, thinking about that one a little bit ways along the ways. Um, but we're very interdisciplinary and um, you'll be taking classes with students in all those programs. So it's kind of nice to even begin the interdisciplinary experience while you're in, while you're in your program. Like I said, there's other credentials, um, CRCC, and, and I helped with this effort, I helped design the curriculum for this, has recently reinstated the certification as both a nationally certified vocational evaluator, so specialty in assessment, and within the state of New York, um, uh, moving toward that addiction specialist. Um, so that's called a KSAC in the state of New York. We have two clubs and or honor society, you know, an honor society for our student. Um, we do have a chapter of Chi Sigma Iota, which is our counseling honor society for students who are in our program with three, five or better GPA after taking a full semester of courses um, and in good standing with their faculty. And then our student counseling association, that's the association of students in the counseling professions. Um, I'm the advisor to that club and we, Chi Sig and ASCP work closely together. Uh, we've been doing some great stuff. It's very student driven, very student led. Um, this whole year, we've actually, the students um, really have, has been devoting programming to Black Lives Matter and really understanding that and, and integrating that into their practice. And this upcoming year, we're working on a full programming around developing advocacy within the students, um, both, both with our clients, for our clients and for the profession. We, um, if you're in the rehab counseling program, myself and Dr. Midas are, are the two primary advisors. You will be assigned to one of us, but you know we're both there. And when we are actually physically on campus, we have a full on open door policy where if we're there, you can talk to us. Um, but also those, I have a lot of students that may have designs on maybe going on for a PhD someday. So I've been working with a lot of students for kind of preparing them for you know, what that would look like and, and really engaging in opportunities that are important to them. We do have assistance with placement for field work. We are not going to throw you to the wolves and say, all right, go find somewhere. Um, we have, you know, vetted um, field work sites with the right supervisors and the right types of experiences that you need. And that's going to be a process to develop based on where you live, what you want to do, you know, and uh, what your interest area is. And then also we have, um, when you get later in your program, um, we used to do this once a year in January, but I'm actually in the process of Hopefully, if I have the technological skills, I'm gonna to have to have one of my millennial students teach me this, but um, I'm gonna to try to do a YouTube channel of all of our kind of test prep sessions that we do so that students can do it more self-paced on their own rather than, than doing just one kind of like live session. Um, but the exam is offered three times a year. So in, in March, in July, and in October. So usually, like I said, students take it either the summer before their semester that they graduate or in the semester that they graduate. Um, so I kind of talked about this in order to apply grad application, all your transcripts from any school, undergrad or grad that you attended, you will have to complete a personal statement about what's important to you in the field and where you, you know, kind of how you're gonna use this degree, but I have a document that guides you into what to include in that statement. Three letters of recommendation, we'd like at least one to be academic and speak to your academic potential, but I also have a guidance document on that that you can give to the folks who are creating those for you so that they can hone in on some of those professional dispositions. Your resume, especially if you wanna highlight any work you've done in the past with people with disabilities. A person um, following that, you know, once you know, I've reviewed the application and the idea is that we'll proceed that you, you appear to be a good candidate on paper. Um, I'll bring you in for a personal interview. And again, those are very scenario-based situational types of questions to really get, get into those professional dispositions. And then after the interview, um, we have a live writing sample that you're just going to do, which is like a case-based, you know, writing sample, just so we can really, you know, get to see how you uh, kind of perform in your feet and, and just kind of conceptualize, you know, ahead of time. So if you are, you know, truly interested in the program, obviously I can set up a one-on-one -on -one with me, or you can talk to Dr. Midas. So, so for our faculty to really kind of understand, well, <laughs> I'm getting myself into this, what does it look like? You know, I can tell you about the load and when the classes are and all those sorts of things. However, sometimes it's better to get a different perspective. I can, if you're interested, I can match you up with an alumni who's out there, maybe based on, you know, kind of where you see yourself going in the future, they can talk to you about the field or even one of our current students. 
you know, because I, you know, maybe you're, uh, you know, a mom of small children who are, you know, who's trying to manage that at the same time, I can match you up with a student who's kind of having that same experience and say, okay, you know, what's it like for them? You know, I've, I have students who are veterans. I have students who have disabilities. I have students from, you know, from different geographies and things like that to, so I can help you depending on what you see as some of the questions you have or aspects you'd like to explore about types of support and resources in the program, then we can do that, okay? 